the melody race you know quite a few dozen boats all milling around the same marker emotions running wild nervous excited you know just you're watching your gauges watching your temperatures watching your pressures just hoping that everything works the way it should and um, five minutes at that point in time into the mill it feels like you're there for the last half an hour you know it, it feels like it's taking forever to start the start of the race was a little nerve-wracking, you know, you get there and the 70-mile an hour boats start with all of the, the bigger boats. So you're in a mill with boats that do 130 miles an hour. While you're sitting in the mill and you're driving around, you're thinking, all right, I have a solid hour and a half to two hours of beating to take now. And, you know, you try to prepare yourself for it mentally. Um, hope nothing goes wrong, hope nothing, you know, no wipeouts, nothing. And, I learned a few prayers. <laughs> you need to. Yeah, well, I've raced over 10 years, and it's the first time Michael and I have ever raced together. <clears throat> so it's the first time Michael has ever raced in his life. So it was a bit nervous on the start. Um, a lot of big boats, a lot of fast boats. We didn't have the race channel, so um, we didn't know when the race was going to start. So we actually were kind of waiting wrong. We were probably a little too relaxed because I was watching 8 o'clock, and my watch was actually like three minutes slow. So he was like, this, this race isn't supposed to start yet and everybody is gone. So then eventually he said, no, nah, it, it must have started. So that's when we, we actually started going. Well, the milling, at the milling, we hit something under the water that tore off part of our skeg. So um, the tide was low and all of a sudden, Katunk, part of the skeg, we didn't know it was a part of the skeg coming off, but we, hit, we certainly hit something big and heavy. So um, we're milling around um, by, the, by the Hyatt, uh, just waiting for our chance and trying to get it perfectly right, which is obviously what you're trying to do, right? Looking for that green flag to drop. And then as it dropped, we got a perfect start. Once the flag drops and the race is off, you know, your nerves, everything calms right down. And you just focus on the race and your trim and where your competition is and so forth. Yeah, just as we as the as the um, the green flag dropped and we started to accelerate, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning of the race, we were around the smaller boats, and, and and James said to me, "Guy, can you see over those?" And I said, "No, I can't, but they have to go." And so, you know, the bow was like that as we're going on playing. Yeah, yeah they were milling in front of us, and we knew they came out the mill just in front of us. So all we did was we saw, see the boats from the side leaving and we gave them a couple of seconds and we said well they have to be in front gone. and they have to be gone so we took the chance and we came up and playing there and 
When we, yeah. when the bow dropped back down, they, they were right there. Them. They were right there. <laughs> Turn right. <laughs> and um, then we just laid down the throttle and we got a brilliant start. Um, we were way out in front. Yeah, we were. And we were waiting, waiting, waiting for, for, for the, the bigger um, boats, the bigger boats to pass. Yeah. And um, it took a while. So when we started, we got a good start. Um, fire one and I believe Holland has passed us pretty close on both sides of the boat at the same time. So we got a bit of whitewash, stuck on the outside, and then we continued to the boca at our pace. Our plan was not to push the boat to the limit, but to reach the Tobago. As we came up to start and the, the flag dropped, um, we were on the, 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 in between two of the bigger boats. Uh, Fire One was on our left, and I can't remember who was on the right. Um, and that, that boat gets on the plane pretty quickly, so I floored it and I jumped out between them. And about three seconds later, a big roar and a spray and Fire One shot between us and some other boats. So it was a little bit intense on the start. We went into the, the first marker, which is the recording most western marker, in fourth. Um, the boat was running well up until we got like around the yacht club area, West Morins, and a water hose coming through the, the canopy blew off. We, we stopped to, 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 to well, see what we could do. We, we ended up just making a little quick fix inside the canopy. He put two tie shafts on the hose and he said, look, I'm going to hold it, let's go. And that's what we did. Held on, he held on to the hose like that, you know, holding on to that thing. And of course, now we can't run top or top end. And anytime we hit like around 95 miles an hour, James is a guy, 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 I feel in this hose, it's pulsing, it's pulsing. <laughs> At this point, we said, well, look, let's, let's just keep try, going. Yeah, try to make it there. Let's just try to let's make it there. Let's get there, we, we, can, we, can we can win the class at least, you know. We figured we were about close to 10 minutes behind, you know, the bigger boats at that time. Well, we got a perfect, lovely start. Smooth, fantastic. Boat pulled off nice. And we were up, up in front of everybody. Our, our radio went bang, so we didn't know uh, where we were, if, uh, if everything was okay. So we just decided to keep going and go for it. So we, we, we headed out, we went around our, 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 our laps on the first, second section of the course. Come back by Hyatt. Well, so Solo has been is a, is a smaller boat with more or less the same power. They, they, they have very good acceleration. They didn't really walk away from us, but we, they did get a good start. We didn't get as good a start as them, and you know they, they got out, they got away a little bit from us, but not not much. And then we gained back on them in the turn down on by the TYC turn, and then we gained back on them again um, coming back into the into the harbour around the movie town point. And then when we came into the harbour again, then when we had our problem with that marker, when we had to make that little less than the second turn, so that's when we lost back some distance on solo at that point. At that point, we were really young. We didn't know where Paramount was, we didn't know where anybody was. We were just really, really following solo. And, you know, we really wouldn't worry about them anyway, because, you know, I mean, they, they were just on a penalty, so, you know, <laughs> we weren't that concerned at that point in the race, really. We put a new cap on the canopy because of a recent accident to reinforce the canopy. So, um, if it, you know, so we, that, that reduces the amount of, of glass space that we have. So the visibility out there is reduced from what we used to have. And um, we don't see what's behind us. We only see like what's 90 degrees left and right. And that's when you're driving or throttling. Um, in the back seat, I see like 45 degrees left and right. But we don't really care who's behind us, to be honest with you. It's who's in front of us we want to worry about. There's the guys to catch. Inside the Gulf was perfect. Beautiful, milky, milky water. As you can see by the footage there, the boat running perfectly smooth, fantastic. No problems at all. It was just, if it was just like that outside, then what a thing. Another record. Um, but from the start of the race, I really never only, I saw Paramount a couple of times and my side mirror behind, I saw them creeping up on us a couple of times. Um, I was quite surprised that they didn't pass us with any girls because they are uh, known to be a very fast and light boat. Um, but, you know, we just maintained our lines, you know, in the Gulf. Uh, Solo always had 
couple of boat lengths well in front of us in the, in the Gulf, but from the time we turned Point Belen, started to head towards the Boca and coming into the rough part of the, of the course, we just slowly crept up on Solo. Then we head off up to uh, Five Islands, and the boat just wants to keep going. Go, go, go. But we have a speed limit of 130, right? So we're trying to keep it on 129.457 all the way. We, we just wanted to keep going and keep our pace. Uh, not break out, of course, because when you break out, you get, you get penalties. Um, so oh yeah, our, our, our intercom in the cockpit was, had gone bang, which makes it more difficult to communicate, of course, right? So what did we have? We had we devised a, a system where if, if Darren was heading too close to 130, I would slap him, give him a slap, and he'd just pull back again. Now he told me afterwards he wasn't pulling back because he was pulling back because of the pain. That was a wince because I was slapping him kind of harder. So as we uh, as we cross uh, the point by by the back of uh, Five Islands, um, we we come around and there's a fisherman pulling up a fish, gets the shock of his life, dropped the fish in the water, waving his arms, and off we go, heading off up to the Boca. Coming up to the Boca, that's always a nerve-wracking experience because you can't see your exit. So as we're going up, and now normally there might be a boat ahead of you somewhere along the way that you can take a line off. But this year there was no boat ahead of us, so we had to find our own exit. And as you know, all those spectator boats just got to sort of crowd around. Um, now when you're coming up to that, it's like you're going to run into a dead end. But you know, you sort of trust there is an opening, right? So. Uh, I mean, it is always there, but you only see it when you get on top of it. Well, the, 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 the traffic in Boca is always a problem, but this year it wasn't so bad. Um, what happened though is that there was a little boat happened to be going through the Boca, a race boat that was going through the Boca pretty much at exactly the same time as the big boats were. And he had the inside of the corner, and then Solo was going through the corner ahead of us, and slowing down Darren is a very conservative guy going through the Boca. He always slows right down in the Boca, which is fine, I used to do that a lot too, but now we're racing in that different area, so he slowed down, coming around there and, and, and kind of closed, not closed the door, but narrowed the, narrowed the aperture that we would have to go through. So that, that kind of squeezed us into him. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a dangerous um, distance or anything, but just, you know, some of the photographs I've seen make it look from, a, from certain angles like we were right on top of them, but it wasn't like as, as bad as that. But it was certainly uh, too, you know, too close, you really don't want to pass both that close. But, you know, it happens all the time in racing. They started to turn, we all kind of came through at the same point, that small boat was there, that was one of the smaller boats that started before. And I just remember Peter saying, uh, thread the needle, Joe, thread the needle, thread the needle, you know, because we, we saw that gap getting smaller and smaller. And I tried my best to, to stay a certain distance from, from, from you know, the small boat as well as, as Solo, because we were creeping up on them at that point. Um, as a driver, this is my second year driving. In all the years that I've ever raced, I, I used to throttle. You know, I, I have now taken the position of, of, of driving, and it's, I actually enjoy it. It's not as much work as the throttle man, especially in a boat that size. But it, it, you know, you do get concerned when you're coming in to the Boca, especially at that speed, and there are other boats around, whether it's you know, spectators or other race boats. But I held my line as good as I, I could. It was nothing intentional. Um, but that's racing, you know, and it's everybody's looking to go into the Boca and then make a, a right angle to go up the north. All right, so we come out in Boca, face Boca. Um, Monster came right behind us, just look back. It's like turn right, turn right, pulling steering, turn right as, as much as I could. There had a lot of boats on the right, so trying to concentrate and not do anything to, to prevent the boat from hooking or so on. Um, and they passed really close. Jason could literally stuck his hand out, I would say, and touch Monster. Um, but they passed us in a flash, so he went back into their wake and continued to be north coast. 
Well, it was it was a bit nerve wracking for sure. Um, they passed probably within about eight feet of us, and it felt more like eight inches. It felt like I could have almost put my hand out and grabbed the boat. Well, as you come out of the boca, you then get into the ocean water, right? which is different water. You know, you get swells in in the boca. You start getting some sleeping soldiers, as they call them, which is the tide coming against the, uh, well, the two tides meeting. So you get you get bumps in the like a, a slow a, a smooth bump in the bo in the boca like speed bumps. Then those speed bumps, once you get outside, become bigger bumps, which stop your speed. You can do a little bit, you can do certain speed on the speed bumps, but uh, which you sort of fly off them, right? But once you go outside, you gotta pull back your speed and adjust your boat again, get the, get the stance proper for the bigger waters. Because that, once you get out there, you're, you're in the ocean. And then your, your water's coming from a different angle and you have to adjust your speed, etc., to, to cope with it, or else you get into trouble. Well, as I say, we weren't concerned about solo because they were racing with a penalty. Um, Paramount, of course, was our, our main competition in our head at that point in time, because we knew that, you know, they were, they were, you know, big and capable boat, and so they should be in the Asia, and they were running with no penalty, so, you know. We were looking for both of them on the North Coast, but what we knew on the North Coast is that we had the advantage. So as we, as we got on the North Coast, we said, right, this is our time to settle down, and, it's not about any 130 here, nobody can do any 130 outside here, so you know, the speed bracket and the limit that we, we have to maintain is not important on the North Coast. Nobody was doing 130 miles an hour on the North Coast. And then all of a sudden, Monster took us on the inside, yeah, because uh, for one reason, I think, well, for a certain reason, that um, our intercom had gone off, and we were, had a little problem communicating with each other on, the, on, on setting the boat up. So you, as you see by the footage there, we're doing a little bit of a shimmy dance a little bit. That was trying to adjust the boat to suit the, the water conditions. And Monster, I would say, I think had their intercom in place. The communication was quicker. So they got that a bit better than us. The rougher the water is, the, is the further we'll be in front. You know, that boat is designed to run in big water, rough water, big chop, small chop, medium chop, whatever, you, you know. Um, it's not a boat to do the highest of speeds in the idealist of conditions, but when it when it comes to you know windy conditions, chop, big swells, that is the boat, you know. And the Great Race typically is that type of water. Hardly, rarely, you would ever get flat water on the north, and it's never flat. You still have these sleeping policemen, as we call them, and that is where this boat really performs, you know. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a very large boat. It's the biggest boat out there, really. Even though the other boats um, claim to be, you know, be like Mystic is a 50 footer. If you really look at, at, at Monster next to the Mystic, Mystic is a smaller boat. It is, it is 50 feet, but there's a big long overhang that sucks off the back. And the, the, the hulls are very are much slimmer and smaller, and the boat is a lower profile boat and it's smaller. It's very, very, very modern technology, very fast boat. Um, but I still prefer to have a little weight and it's well, a lot lighter than us. So I still feel the extra weight on the North Coast, especially if you're not trying to do 170 miles an hour, um, it's definitely the extra weight is going to help you. We are a bigger, heavier, longer boat. You know, length is strength in Europe. The conditions on the north coast was it was rough. I haven't I don't think I've raced in, in the in the couple of years that I've been racing, I haven't ever seen it that rough before. 
Um, it was to the point where everything in the boat was getting beaten about. Everything. The, the ignition, when we shut down, when we looked at where the key goes in, that was broken from the dash and hanging down inside the hole. So that's to tell you, that'll give you an idea as to how bad that was. So that's when we, we lost a lot of speed. We started doing anywhere between 53, 55, going up the north. Um, I took a little bit more work out at Chad. I mean, I couldn't put too much tabs down to slow it, and you don't, to slow the boat down any further than that. But, um, you know, we trim it out as best as possible. And um, it took him a little while getting used to, to how the boat handles and stuff, because, I mean, didn't have too much time in the boat going into a great race. And especially with water like that, I mean, it, it was going to be difficult for him. That was like baptism by fire, basically. Um, but he handled his stories going up and um, I think when we were just about by tracking station, that's when I felt the boat, you know, I looked back at the engine and I saw the engine moving a little bit more than it should have been. So we slowed down a little bit there. By that time we had basically had at least about five, five, ten minutes on the on Predator 3, I believe. Right, um, we stopped, checked the engine, checked all the bolts, stuff that we had done prior to the race and everything looked like they were tight and so on. So he said, all right, no problem. Continue up the, the course. By that time, Predator had already caught up on us. So we dropped throttle again, took off in front of them, and um, we were running up the north for quite some time. I've been with Energizer for two years now. Um, the first year we went over, uh, what was like a, a lake. So that was a, a dream. I mean, it was as if we were just cruising on the islands. Uh, this race this year was a lot more challenging. Um, and the problem was when we were leaving the water, the re-entry was always challenging. Uh, Energizer, we run um, two what are called Anderson surface drives. So they are not the normal legs. So our propeller extends uh, three or four feet, two or three feet behind the stern of the boat. So anytime she leaves the water and she comes back in, any slight movement of the steering wheel will cause the boat to, to give a sharp turn, either to port or to starboard and which we experienced quite a few. And uh, there were a lot of discussions between Anthony and myself going up the road, how we could, uh, how we could manage those re-entries. And it came a time when we decided, look, just once she leaves the water, just let go of the wheel. Um, and let her come back in on her own and she will correct on her own. And then as she touches the water again, grab back the wheel. And that seemed to work. But I, I must admit it was a little hairy, <laughs> letting go of the wheel in those kind of waters um, to let the boat do it. But, uh, she handled well. Uh, once she left the water and, and you left her on her own, she will come back in on her own and she will behave quite nicely. Yeah, as soon as we come on the boat and we realize, well, it has, there's, there is definitely a little water out there, it's not flat, you know, so that, you know, this is where we're going to separate the men from the boys. And I mean, we are confident at that point that there was nothing going to hold us to be. Just to see everything had to stay together. And when we went up the road, we were going up the road, we could have gone up, up you know, faster. It would have been more dangerous. But we went up the road fast enough to stay in front of everybody, and then eventually we did just disappear out the back, and we didn't know where they were going. So, and all of that point, we thought, great, we have this here, this is definitely going to work, but we have this, we still have to keep running. And then the little gremlins start poking their head up. and. As we saw ourselves slowly pulling away from Solo, and of course, Paramount basically disappearing in, in, in the back. We, we slowly brought it back down to about 110, 108, 112, 108, you know. And we kind of maintain that going up all the way up to Shodo into Maracas. And it's, it's going into Maracas and coming out of Maracas where we really realized that our competition was really far behind. We, could, we couldn't even see a splash, you know. You look, look left as you're coming out of Maracas, look down towards Shodo and we couldn't even see anyone. I believe both Solo and Paramount may have sustained problems by then. Well, thank God Peter made the decision to get those suspension seats because they really do make a big difference. But um, uh, that the boat is just perfectly balanced. It's, this, the suspension seats are a big plus. And I really can't say that I have, it's the first time that I have completed so much of the course in a long time. I stopped racing for, for like nine years and I woke up next morning after great race feeling fine. You know, normally after a great race, your lower back, your neck, your arms, everywhere is hitting you. And I really can't see that I experienced that this, this year, you know. The combination of the suspension seats and the, the, the ride in that boat, you know, combined definitely isn't as bad. And I'm, I'm older than I used to be. I mean, I started racing in 93, you know. So it, it, it definitely isn't as bad. I mean, the water wasn't the worst it could be. It wasn't calm either, but it definitely is a pretty smooth ride. 
Well, throttling the boat is the most is, is, is what you know the fun of the boat because you really get the you know the feel and the power of the engines and you know what it, you know what it's doing over the water. Um, the mission is to try and not have the engines over rev on you while you're leaping through the air from one wave to the other. You cannot if you just keep the throttle buried, you, you, you know you're going to destroy the engine soon enough. And um, that's really the mission. So as you're jumping off, you'll hear the engines come on and come off and come on and come off. You know, people might wonder why, why is that why is that you know happening? But that's just really to save the engines from over revving and from coming apart. Well, the, the real thing about the communication is that it's, 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 it's whether it's with Joey and myself, it's just almost not even necessary. I don't even have to think about what he's doing. I know he's going to do the right thing. So I just, it's almost like I'm driving, I'm turning the boat, and I hope that he feels the same way. Really, don't have to think about what we're doing. It just happens. You know, naturally, as the, we do talk to each other, of course, to make sure that we we we're on the same page when we're talking about going into a corner, or you know what line we want to go down, to approach the corner at, and you know, and um, any more than that, and I'll be taking away secrets. So it's a, Of the course, we had our normal brother sister fights, our disagreements with what each other was doing, but we basically worked it out and got up there in one piece. He, as a driver with experience as a driver, helped me. He was able to correct me when I was doing stuff that was not correct or made mistakes. He was he could have helped me correct me, so that was good. Your role as a driver is basically going up the course in those water conditions to predict the way the wave will throw the boat when it leaves the water because with those waves the boat is going to leave the water fully so you don't want it pelting all over the place to either side you try to keep it straight so the driver now has to predict which way the wave is going to pelt the boat to correct it to see how best it could land straight growing up the north coast we found uh, we found ourselves struggling to keep up with the larger boats the problem for us is that being the smallest boat in the class, when you start to get into the rougher water, the bigger boats can handle the, the, the waves a little better and they, they maintain more speed. And, you know, having to push in places where we probably should have not pushed as hard as we did. And um, we took one awkward jump and the boat came out of the water at a, at a very sharp angle, so sideways, not even up or down, but at an angle. And when we landed, um, full hook. Uh, I don't remember. I remember, you know, being in the air and landing. And the next thing I remember was then bang when my helmet hit Timothy's helmet, and I almost flew out. I don't know what I was holding on to. I don't know what kept me in the boat. I landed back in my seat and realized that we were okay. That the boat hadn't broken, and I was back on the throttle right away. And, you know, it's a race that happens. Uh, the larger boats, because of their weight and their size, they don't jump as much, they don't jump as high, they don't jump as far. And so they, they can stay closer to the speed class. Um, and it, it gives them the advantage in the rougher water. In the calmer water, you know, we're even, we're very perfectly matched. But the minute you start to get into the rougher stuff, you know, you, you, you start to lose that gap. And I remember as we passed, Shodo and it really started to bang and started to bite. You know, we would just, every wave, they would just pull a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And you, until eventually when we were into Maracas, 
we were just coming into Maracas and we could see um, Wright Formula exiting Maracas. So he had built that lead on us. And every time we got back into the rough, he just built the lead a little more, a little more, and a little more. Yeah, you have to be in sync with your driver and your throttle man, everybody. You know, each one has to have faith in the other that they're going to do the right thing. Um, because they're little things that you have to keep doing, you know. The, the boat will start to walk on, and you have to, the driver has to be able to correct and the throttle man has to know that he's, he can continue applying power and that it'll be corrected or that when to pull off, when to go on. So, you know, each person has their own role and each person knows what it is that they have to do. And you, you well, we have the, the contact so we can talk as we go and, you know, keep each other motivated because uh, your arms get tired, you're constantly banging in your seat and you, you have to keep telling each other, keep focused, you know, we're doing, we're doing good, we, we get in there and it, racing is painful, you're in a sitting position, um, the dashboard where your knees go, um, we put padding and protection but some, some of the impacts are so hard that my knees would fly up and actually split through the protective covering. So my knee was hitting straight fiberglass. Um, the impacts in the seat, the, you, you land so hard, your ears ring. Uh, you can feel your insides shift. You can actually, I mean, I've had, I've had impacts that were so hard that your air, you land and your ears go and you, you, you literally you know, you're out for a split second and you have to, you know, keep concentrating and focusing and keep yourself going. I think the next milestone was seeing Solo. They were running. They were running, but they were running, they were running at a lower, a lower speed. Mm. We didn't know what their problem was. We figured they had to have been having some kind of engine problem. So we said, okay, so that's one big boat down. And by this time, we figured that, obviously figured that, we, that we Monster, three, four, Monster and sure. Paramount were still in front. Just coming up to the, we're looking out, starting to look for Grand River Marker. We saw the three boats, which we figured right, that's the 95 boats, and they were all running together, which looked real nice. So we picked a line through the middle of all three boats. Um, Savage, Stinging Metal and, and Dragon. Dragon was outside. Was on the outside of us and came through. You know, we, I mean, we, we were running at a decent pace there. And the guy's brother is in the Dragon, so he said, you know, you know, give it a little throttle. When we spoke to them after, they said they saw us, so he gave a little throttle too. So yeah, it you know, seemed like we came, we came up on them. We came up on them quickly, and then when we got into the into the middle of them. Like we weren't, we, although we had, were maintaining the same speed, they were, they had stepped up a bit. So we knew that, that um, the Dragon being an open boat, they had a third man in the seat. So yes, kind of so figured that they, look, they were looking back and they saw us coming so and they did say that that's exactly what happened. So they were leading out, they were actually in front of the other 295 man on our boat. So when they picked it up, the other two guys, Singing Metal and, and, and Savage seemed to pick it up. So we kind of hung there with them for, you know, not too long. A couple of minutes in. And then, um, and then I said, okay, well, let's go. And I just nudged the throttle a little bit. And we went to, found the Grand Rivier Mark. Grand Rivier was, that, as, we, as we hit the water in Grand Rivier, that was different. That water was yeah. a bit different. Yeah, the water definitely picked up from the marker, maybe two, three miles, leaving Grand Rivier, heading towards Pigeon Point. Um, going up the north coast, we probably held between 70 to 75 miles an hour. Um, that was a pretty comfortable speed to race at for the water conditions that day. Um, there really wasn't much of a need to push it any harder than that as we were all basically uh, very close to our competition between Gulf Dragon and, and Savage. Um, so we all basically averaged the same speed and just kind of stuck with one another. And um, yeah, it was just it was a comfortable speed to race at. Uh, while, while you're going up the north coast, um, the race is so long and becomes so monotonous that um, throttle men in particular tend to start sleeping at the throttles and, and you don't realize it but you actually start going a little slower and a little slower and every so often you might look in your review mirrors or look to the side of you and see some of your competition right there next to you and it kind of gives you a wake up call and makes you realize look, 
put the power on, go a little faster, they're catching you. Every so often they might catch you and pass you, which is what happened between myself and, and Golf Dragon at one point in time. Once you have your competition right next to you, it, it brings out the excitement in, in racing again. You know, it's, 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 it's actually, it's quite boring once you're out there by yourself, but once you have competition around and you know that your competition is making you push harder and run your boat faster and, and you know, you have to play with your trim a lot more, um, it's pretty exciting, it's pretty exciting. Um, the water conditions that day, it didn't really allow us to push much harder than 75 miles an hour. I mean, we probably could have run closer to 80, but at the same time, you don't want to mash yourself up, you don't want to mash up your boat or your equipment. The name of the game in Great Race really is just at least making it to Tobago. You know, and that in itself is a great achievement. Yeah, that's, um, that's the best part of um, racing in a, in a nice, a nice tight class. Um, we, we were jockeying for position right through. Um, although we had to leave for most of the North Coast, um, the, other, the other boats were within eyesight of, of us, um, particularly Sting in Metal and, and Savage. Um, we had a nice run, the adrenaline is pumping, you know that you have to be on top of your game, otherwise they're gonna, they're gonna gain ground um, too easily. And probably around, um, around Paria, we will, um, we know the fact that um, that fire one is coming up on us, um, and she's a sister boat, so we just couldn't let her have a way and pass her. So we actually um, accelerated a little, a little faster than we were going up the north coast. We probably brought it up to about 90, just to try to keep her at bay for, for as long as we could. Although it was inevitable that she would pass us, but we didn't want to make it um, too easy for her. So all that, all that added to the, the, the drama and the excitement of running up the north coast with company. We sustained three problems. I mean, I guess we'll never 100% know for sure in what sequence it happened, but it more or less happened one after the other. Um, uh, one of the, the lines to the water cooler blew a O-ring, so we, was, we were leaking a lot of water in the hull, but we had discovered that, that that problem was happening. You know, she started to kind of land on the port side, so Peter put the bilge pumps on, and that, that, that solved that. That didn't stop us. And at some point, we, we lost a blow bell, and now, you know, again, that didn't stop us. What really stopped us was the, the coil. You know, the bracket hole in the coil for some strange reason broke. Coil started slapping around in the engine. Um, it eventually cracked, and we just started losing more and more spark to the distributor. And you know, we just eventually lost all the power to the engine. Um, managed to keep it on plane, which is a very difficult thing to do on a boat that size. Um, but we, we just kind of held the other engine open to get us a stopy. And you know, at that point, Peter jumped out and to go and have a look to see what was really wrong and when we saw the amount of problems we had, we just called it a day, you know. The, I, I find the water be, going across never really eased up until we were almost right on the corner at Store Bay. And uh, the land sort of, we, we got into the lee of the land and it, and it eased down, it calmed down a bit. When we were coming into Store Bay now, our eyes were to the right. We were looking, looking east to see the boats, any yeah. boats going up to looking to Scarborough, to Scarborough, looking for wash because we're thinking the two big boats ahead of us. You know, we didn't see you know, any wash coming out of the marker from Stowe. You know, heading towards Scarborough. When we looked to the west, I said, well, "What's Solo doing here? How, how we get here so fast?" And and guy took a, a second look and he's like, "But that's monster. That's on Solo." So now we got. So now, now we're in second. Excited. We really, we really getting excited now yeah. because we see we're coming from the back here and we enter second already. So let's, we're well not already, but that piece of water between Storby and, 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 and Scarborough was, phew, that was a mess. They didn't have any, seem to have any kind of pattern. 
There was swells, there was chop, there was we one time I think. What was it? I telling you, go inside. I think I wanted to run away from the from, yeah, from the yeah. water. <laughs> we were, yeah, we're coming up on the, the Lambo mark there where we have the plotter set at a mark, but there's there's not really a, it's just an individual mark and from running there in the past, you, you could in calmer water you could see where the breakers are because the reef comes out pretty far. And I was telling the guy, look for the breakers, look for the breakers, because I want to cut the corner as close as possible, obviously to shorten the line. And then at one point he says, we too close in, we too close in. So we went back out, took, took the line back out a little bit more, and we were watching the mark on the GPS. Then you tell, think you tell, you tell, we're looking for the top. breakers, <laughs> we're looking for the breakers, and, 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 and one, then all of a sudden I think we were in the breakers. <laughs> So we just did a did a yeah, right turn, right, did get out, out, get back outside, and um, settle ourselves down a little bit, you know. <laughs> and then we were. By the time we, we, we did that, we could see Scarborough. We saw the Ollie markers and, and the finished boat and stuff like that. So we were. We knew by then that we were finishing the race at that point. You know, I'd like to to let it all all out when we when we got to Scarborough, especially finishing stretch, but the water wasn't really gonna allow us to do that so we just still had to be careful I, I think there was one or two times on that finishing circuit you know you get carried away and you want to show off in front of the crowd and I was always letting you do that yeah, for sure <laughs> and uh, I thought about um, the boat from last year uh, Miss Trinidad it was show boat and ended up with our boat going upside down so we finished the race crossed the line and we were pleased with the performance, you know. We knew we won our class. Yeah. We got out the canopy and we started to look for Paramount because we thought Paramount was going to be parked up there somewhere. And we kind of look in and we can't see Paramount. We couldn't see any other boats. So then I said, well, let me call Ronald, who's in race control. So I called Ronald and he said, boy, congrats, you all win. He said, what? We win our class? He says, no, you just win the great race. So I said, great was, race. You serious? Was, that was excitement. <laughs> that was better than last year. And I turned the guy and I said, you win. And he still couldn't believe. I said, call him back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just in case they, 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 they're playing with us, you know. Approaching the, fi the finish was many mixed emotions. It was a bit of excitement. A bit of nervousness, you know, did we break out at any point in time? Have we passed all our markers correctly? Um, a bit of shock, not expecting to do so well for my first time. Um, happy, just many, many mixed emotions. Um, but going into Scarborough, the water was lumpy. I mean, you're tired at this point in time, you're dehydrated. It's been an hour and a half of, of constant pounding we've been taking. Um, basically, we just actually just trying to finish making our way towards the finish line. Um, there was a bit of miscommunication in the cockpit while we were heading into Scarborough. Um, there were three markers in Scarborough, which two of them you had to pass in between to, for the first lap. And then to complete the finish, you had to pass in between another two. And uh, neither Conrad or myself were sure where to go. So we went where we thought we should have gone. And after we passed it, we realized, look, something is not right here. I think maybe to be safe, so we don't get us qualified. Let's make a 360, deg a 360 degree turn around the marker, just to be safe, and then complete our lap and a half, which is what we did, and thank God we did, because if we didn't, we would have been disqualified. But once we crossed the finish line and we checked in with race control and found out, look, you're officially second overall, first in your class, um, no penalties, no breakouts, it was, it was a very overwhelming yet, yet humbling experience, especially for our first time. Um, coming around by, um, by Lowlands area, we, um, we picked up another, um, another race boat ahead of us and made a run for it. Because at that point in time, we were, we were pretty much sure that we were in the top five, but we weren't sure how high up we were. So we um, made a run for it. It turned out to be White Heat, which we passed to the, um, to the south side heading into, into Scarborough. It was a sight to see because it was a long race and we were, we were getting a little tired. It took a lot of concentration coming around the course because at that time you want to finish. Um, the crowd is there, the adrenaline is pumping, so we, um, we took the course quite fast 
but um, quite tight as well. The Dragon handles circuits quite well. We did a nice tight finish, um, pretty much at near our top end speed of about 90, and, um, and we had a good finish. You know, it worked out good in the end. We finished hard and that was the best we could have done. Basically, the feeling that we had when we were going into Scarborough was that we had done it, we had accomplished it, and we had made the boat ready and good enough, despite the fact that we didn't have time to dial the boat in and check any systems, but we had done everything to our best ability. And the only thing that really was wrong was that the fuel system, we weren't able to modify it to suit the needs and demands of the engine. The engines, being bigger engines now, demand a tremendous amount of fuel or fuel feed. And as a result, they, went, they were starving for fuel. So every time I advanced the throttle to, to full speed, the uh, engines would be starving for gas. As a result, we just had to save the engines, so just bring it back and um, you know, just cruise at whatever speed. That speed turned out to be approximately uh, 70 miles an hour. It was good enough for the third place. But in the whole uh, journey over to Tobago, it just had a, a Cadillac ride. Just, just as much you, well, what we are seeing on the, um, on the screen, it really was a beautiful ride, very comfortable. At no time did we ever even get a splash of water hitting us on the um, helmets or even coming over the deck. So a really nice feeling is what I can say going into Tobago that we actually did it. We actually were able to beat a lot of boats who have money to spare, to prepare, to throw, literally, literally throw at the boats and the preparation. And we just made it happen. So I'm very, very happy for that. It actually worked for us. So we got into Storby and around those markers, the, the, we saw the crowds at Storby, everyone trying to get a, a, a peep at who was in the race and who was heading to Scarborough. And as we came around the markers, that's where we normally finished years gone by. It was quite a feeling to, to be able to, to come on and the boats cheering us on. And really getting around the point by the airport is where the race started to get rough for us. Water was coming from all directions, all angles. Um, we had to set the trim on the boat a little differently. Uh, we weren't too sure exactly where we were going, so we Besides the problem of the fuel, we had to back down a little bit to, to make sure that we didn't run on a reef in Tobago. Um, but Storbe was behind us, Carver was in front of us, the adrenaline was pumping, and we really um, set our goals to finish the race, and finish the race is what we did, and achieve the goals that we set out. So next season, we take the time to, to dial in the boat now so that the 2013 Great Race would see Rush doing a lot better and a lot more. We went through up to Straw Bay. There we saw a monster tied up. We, we said, whoa, how did he get back here so quick? We thought he had gone through and come back again. Well, no, he's stuck there, right? So that we, we said, well, we have to keep going. So we, we, we got around the, the point, and then because the engine we were on was running at full throttle all the way, all the gas burn out. So we run out of gas on that. But we, we had engine, we had gas on the other engine because the, the tanks aren't linked. So we decided, well, if to finish this race, we've got to get the other engine up and running somehow. So we said, let's give it a bash, or else we're just bobbing out here like a, like a cork. So we, we, we tried a few little 
little kicks and jibs and jabs and the engine all of a sudden kick up and it was a loose electrical connection. You know, so uh, it was probably something we could have fixed earlier, but that just didn't happen. So uh, we, just, we, we got that thing back up. And as you, as, as you know, we just uh, had stop and start in going to Scarborough. We, we got it up, we, we stopped again, we got it up, we got to stop again. Just sheer determination to finish the race and get to Scarborough once at least. Because we never got to Scarborough, it was the first time. Reaching Tobago was an was a absolutely fantastic sight. I mean, after taking our 150 minutes, uh, pure banging the whole way up, we came into Scarborough, uh, sorry, to Stobby, um, and the water flattened right out. And I mean, it was an absolutely great reprieve. But once we made the turn into, into uh, Stobby and we came out and we started heading past lowlands and so on, we experienced some waters there that, that were just as bad as anywhere on the north. I mean, the water was coming from, from all sides. There was no way you could actually judge where the water was coming from. Um, and at some point, just off of, off of Lambeau, it was, it was really, really bad. I mean, um, so close into Tobago, we were trying to finish. We were seeing right formula just ahead of us. We were trying to push to see if we got a quarter. And it was just more air time, more and more air time. And, uh, I guess at that point in time, we were both a little tired, or both a little beaten. But the race was almost finished. One place was ahead of us, and that we had just had to go for it. And so it was rough. Even doing the final lap in Tobago around Red Rock, um, we were getting a predominantly uh, south easterly sea coming in with some fairly large swells. So making the turns inside of there was also quite tricky. But it was a great joy to finish. <laughs> My boat is a Oki Manifel, made in Sweden. It came with a foot throttle. Um, other boats have a hand throttle. Normally a hand or another person uses that to throttle while another person steer the boat. So two persons, one throttling, one steering. That's a regular boat. That is what most of the boats have here in recent. Mine's is one of the only boat that we race with a foot throttle. So the driver actually foot throttles the car like um, the boat like a car and steers it. So if you're coming around a corner, you don't tell, you, you don't, the person don't have to steer, slow down for you. You actually doing your own slowing down and steering. Um, in the beginning, we started with this, with this particular boat. It's four years old now, running in every regatta for the past four years. That crankshaft is not really a, a high performance crankshaft, it's a cast crank. It took a lot of beating. This year, it took a little extra. Right there, in that sort of age, it had a lot of fatigue that had been taken. Right after where the flywheel meets the crank, with all that pedaling and pedaling and pressure and pressure, it's like trying, it's like a car going at 100 miles an hour and something just locked the black wheel and you go to zero. So you just can't imagine that you're doing that three, four hundred times in one hour. Something gonna break. Our crankshaft broke. It was old too. So it did see some fatigue somewhere during the years. And as everything else, I myself was tired. I missed some waves. I did full throttle on some while we were in the air when we should have been backing off. So while the boat was re-entering, we know it was on like half or part throttle, we were on full throttle. The boat was on full speed, so the crankshaft started taking load and started taking load and started taking load. And that is where it's share. When we, when we saw Crown Point, the water got a little smoother. We started to give it a little more, a little more oomph. And then, of course, when the chopper came in, we, we tried to do what we could do. Went into Store Bay, came back out. The water got very rough again, going back into Scarborough. Um, again, came back, came back on the throttle because um, we wanted to make it. it was so close, didn't want to over push it. And then that close into finishing, we could have damaged something or knocked something out of place, you know. Um, however, we, when we pulled back, we saw another boat in the distance. Going towards, coming towards Scarborough, we actually saw Canny Man to our right. So both of us watched each other and said, nah, can't let, can't let these girls beat us. <laughs> but they were coming directly from um, Grand River because they didn't have to come through Storby. So we decided, you know what, that's an extra place we could finish forward if we push it a lot harder. So we pushed it again and we barely got in front of them before we made the circuit in, um, in Scarborough. The outer side of the circuit was rough again came back in and that's how we finished. I believe we finished 10th overall.
Oh, the sea monsters and the paramount dangers, what? Well, the, well, well, those sea monsters and paramount dangers and raging fireworks, they, 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 well, they, didn't, they didn't get us in our class, so we won our class, right? The paramount monsters all stopped. Even though we limped in, we won. So the moral of the story is you gotta keep on going and you don't, the race ain't over until you cross the finish line. So there we have it folks. Out of the 25 boats that entered, only 12 made it to the finish in Scarborough with the first three boats arriving within a 10 minute window. Congrats to the fastest boat to Tobago for 2012, Fire One, in a time of one hour and 24 minutes. Now it's on to class champions where the Predator stole the candy. Our lone Tobago entrant, Predator 3, placed first in the 60 mile an hour class. The ever popular 70 mile an hour class saw all entrants flying wave to wave and taking all the sea had to deliver up. They all finished Great Race 2012, an achievement, while he took home top honours being first in the class. The 95 mile an hour class, as you saw earlier, was action filled all the way across the Tobago, and rush as they may, the dragon got stung and stinging metal basked in the glory of their first place finish. In the 120 mile an hour class, the fireworks were plentiful as Fire One overcoming an initial breakdown thundered in to capture first place. Finally, we have the 130 mile an hour class where Solo finished, limping across the line in a time of 2 hours and 13 minutes to take home first place, a race fought hard to the end.